draw attention to. Uh, on 20th July, I announced that I intend to submit an interim report to His Excellency the Governor-General uh, by 30 September. As I said then, uh, the interim report uh, will identify policy-related issues arising from the first four rounds of uh, hearings, which, uh, as people will recall, dealt with consumer lending, financial advice, business lending to small and medium enterprises, business lending to agricultural enterprises, and issues concerning regional and remote consumers, including, in particular, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the intention is that those who have been directly or indirectly concerned with matters explored in the course of the hearings, as well as the public more generally, uh, will then be invited to make submissions about how the issues that arise uh, should best be dealt with. I must carry out the tasks uh, that I've been given by my terms of reference recognising two things. First, the proper functioning of the financial services entities with which I am dealing is critical to the Australian economy. Second, because what happens in and is done by this commission can have both direct and indirect consequences for the economy, I must deal with the matters expeditiously. It'll be recalled that I said at the first public sitting of the Commission that I understand fully that those affected by what they consider to be misconduct want their complaints recognised and considered and want those responsible held to account. I said then, and I've said more than once since, that the Commission would proceed by case studies to identify the kinds of misconduct that have occurred and that the Commission would not examine publicly every case of alleged misconduct. But as I have also said repeatedly, the public submissions to the Commission are very important and every one of them, I mean every one of them, is read. And it's important to add that very many of those submissions have been considered repeatedly as counsel and solicitors assisting the Commission have looked at what the public have told us to help them decide what case studies are to be examined in the course of hearings. And I know that there are those who are disappointed that their cases have not been examined publicly. And every one of those persons can rightly say that their case is unique. I know that. But it is critical to recognise that the Commission is not a court and cannot and will not adjudicate on the rights and wrongs of particular cases. The Commission's task is to inquire. And the Commission cannot and does not make any decisions about whether those who have been affected by misconduct should have some remedy. Only the courts can make binding decisions of that kind. As I say, my task is to inquire and then to report about what I find. Now, with all this in mind, we have tried in the first four rounds of evidence to identify from the material provided to and gathered by the Commission uh, cases that, when examined in hearings, will help to identify not only the kinds of conduct that have happened, but also why the conduct occurred, what was the response by the relevant entity and by the regulators, what should have been the response, and what recommendations should now be made. Those questions about why, what was, what should have been the response and what should now be done are central to the work uh, of the, that the Commission will undertake after the interim report has been tabled 
and we work towards preparation of a final report. They are therefore questions which will be important to bear in mind when preparing submissions in response to the issues that will be identified in the interim report and will be identified after the next two rounds of hearings. Now, as in previous rounds, I've considered the applications for leave to appear and those whose applications have not been granted have been notified. And the solicitors assisting have explained my reasons for not granting leave. Uh, those uh, whose applications were granted have told the solicitors assisting who will appear for them. There will therefore be no need to announce appearances. Now, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, in this fifth round of public hearings, we will examine the conduct of superannuation trustees in Australia. The purpose of superannuation is to assist Australians to save for retirement. Because of both its purpose and its size, the superannuation industry is of great significance to Australians and to the Australian economy. As at March 2018, Australians had superannuation savings comprising approximately $2.6 trillion of assets. That is equivalent to approximately 144% of Australia's nominal gross domestic product. In Australia, Regulated superannuation funds are established as trusts. The trustee holds the superannuation assets for the benefit of the members or for the member's dependence upon the member's death. The member is the beneficiary of the trust. The trustees are obliged to act in the best interests of the members. Your terms of reference require you to consider the conduct of RSE licensees of registrable superannuation entities. We will briefly explain what that means. There are three types of superannuation trustees in Australia. Trustees of self-managed superannuation funds who are regulated by the ATO and, as at March 2018, held $712 billion of assets. Trustees of exempt public sector superannuation schemes who are regulated by separate Commonwealth or state legislation and, as at 31 March 2018, held approximately $138.8 billion of assets. And finally, trustees of APRA regulated funds who are regulated by APRA under the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act or SIS Act. These trustees held approximately $1.702 trillion of assets as at 31 March 2018. Trustees of APRA regulated funds must be licensed by APRA and you will hear them referred to, Commissioner, as registrable superannuation entity licensees or RSE licensees. Hence, Commissioner, you are concerned under your terms of reference with the conduct of these RSE licensees who collectively hold on trust approximately $1.7 trillion of assets for Australians. The introduction of compulsory superannuation in 1986, coupled with the introduction of the superannuation guarantee in 1992, brought about a seismic shift in Australia's financial landscape. That was an important change for the protection of working Australians. Before 1986, employers had a choice of how or whether to provide superannuation for their employees. In 1986, industrial awards required employers to pay 3% of employees' wages as superannuation contributions. In 1992, compulsory superannuation was extended to all employees and employers have been required to make minimum contributions to employees' superannuation funds since then. This is known as the superannuation guarantee. Compulsory contributions are presently set at 9.5% of an employee's wage or salary. They will rise to 12% by 2026. Superannuation now comprises around 50% of total household as financial assets. In comparison, accounts held with financial institutions currently comprise 15% of total household financial assets. 
the size of superannuation assets means that superannuation is also a significant source of funding for the Australian economy. As at December 2017, superannuation was the second lar largest sector in the financial system by asset size, comprising approximately 29% of Australia's financial institutions' assets. So, what safeguards are there over Australia's, Australians' retirement savings? That question has particular resonance given the significance of superannuation for our national economy today and for the financial security of all Australians in retirement in the future. The first possible safeguard is consumer oversight. Australians might protect themselves by monitoring what is happening with their super. But the available research suggests, as a general rule, that consumers do not do this and nor are they equipped to do so. The 2010 Super System Review, chaired by Jeremy Cooper, <coughs> cited the results of a 2006 Australian Bureau of Statistics survey and said that 46% of 15 to 74 year olds, or some 7 million people, would struggle to understand documentation such as job applications, maps and payroll forms. 53% of surveyed Australians reached just the second of five levels in a practical numeracy test, while 70%, about 10.6 million people, managed only to progress to level two in a series of problem solving exercises. The Cooper Review explained that level three is regarded by the survey developers as the minimum required for individuals to meet the complex demands of everyday life and work in the emerging knowledge-based economy. The Cooper Review noted that a compulsory system based on informed investors making rational choices fails to confront this reality. A later ABS survey in 2011 and 2012 does not show any meaningful improvement. Approximately 44% of Australians aged 15 to 74 had a literacy level of level two or below. More than half of Australians aged 15 to 74 had numeracy skills at level two or below. In general, the proportion of people attaining a literacy or numeracy level of level three or above decreased as age increased. The Productivity Commission, in its recent stage three draft report on competition and efficiency in superannuation, has suggested, based on its member survey with 2,294 respondents, <coughs> that close to 60% of members do not understand their fees and charges, and around 40% lack an understanding of basic investment options, such as growth, balanced, and conservative. The Productivity Commission suggested that broadly, Australians are less financially literate in matters relating to superannuation and retirement planning than in financial matters generally. It noted that poor financial literacy often results in poor economic decision-making, and that an efficient superannuation system would enable those who lack financial literacy skills to obtain trustworthy advice and guide their choices. Australians are not, as a general rule, reviewing the performance of their superannuation fund, comparing that performance to other funds, and making rational choices as to whether they should remain with their fund or switch. Choice, in its submission to the Commission in relation to superannuation, cited research that indicated that 50% to 80% of member switching is simply due to the member changing jobs or the member's employer changing default funds. Even if consumers wanted to try to make an informed choice, the information available is difficult to find and opaque. Consumers might go to a financial advisor but if they do, as ASIC has identified in its report 562 on vertically integrated institutions and conflicts of interest, there is a remarkably high chance, if that advisor is licensed through a vertically integrated entity, that the advisor will recommend an in-house superannuation product. So the second possible safeguard of Australians' retirement savings are the regulators. There are three regulators that have a role to play in superannuation in Australia. The Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, or APRA, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, 
and the Australian Taxation Office. We are concerned in this round of hearings with two of those regulators, APRA and ASIC. The ATO has a general administrative role over aspects of the superannuation system, including oversight of employer contributions. The ATO's key role, however, in relation to superannuation is to regulate self-managed superannuation funds, which are not the subject of, this, of these hearings. The responsibilities of each of APRA and ASIC in relation to superannuation are set out either in the CIS Act or in the case of ASIC in the Corporations Act. APRA is the prudential regulator for Australia. It has described its role in a statement provided to the Commission as being to promote financial system safety and stability. It describes its regulatory approach as being preemptive designed to deal with issues at an early stage before they lead to adverse outcomes. We have already noted that APRA licenses RSE licensees. APRA also determines prudential standards pursuant to the CIS Act, which are to be complied with by the RSE licensees. APRA undertakes supervision activities of RSE licensees to assess how effectively the licensees are meeting the expectations outlined in the standards. APRA has staff, referred to as supervisors, who carry out prudential supervision. Every superannuation entity has a nominated responsible supervisor. APRA views itself as having a different approach from regulators that have mandates to enforce compliance with legislation after a violation of the legislation has occurred. However, APRA is the regulator responsible for enforcing compliance with a number of provisions of the CIS Act. That includes the obligation on trustees to maintain superannuation funds solely for the purpose of providing retirement benefits. This is referred to as the sole purpose test. APRA is the only regulator given the power under the CIS Act to bring civil penalty proceedings for the limited number of contraventions that attract a civil penalty under the Act. One contravention that attracts a civil penalty is contravention of the sole purpose test. The last time APRA commenced a civil penalty proceeding under the CIS Act was in 2004. Judgment was delivered in 2005. APRA is also the regulator given the power under the CIS Act to apply to the federal court for an order disqualifying a person from being a responsible person for a superannuation fund. Between February 2003 and 2008, APRA was able to disqualify a person by administrative decision without applying to the court. During that five-year period, APRA disqualified 133 people. Since 2008, APRA has been required under the CIS Act to apply to the federal court. It has done so once in 2013 for a disqualification order. That was against a former director of TRIO Capital. The application was resolved by the director giving an enforceable undertaking to APRA not to be a trustee or responsible entity of a, super, of a corporate trustee for 10 years. APRA has negotiated enforceable undertakings with 13 former TRIO directors. The Productivity Commission, in its draft report, has criticised what it describes as the behind-closed-doors nature of APRA's supervisory activities, because even if those activities curtail poor behaviour at one fund, they have limited capacity to deter poor behaviour at another. APRA, in its statement to the Commission, has rejected that criticism. It considers that its activities of publishing group letters to RSE licensees, thematic review findings, speeches, articles and other like activities to have considerable benefit in publicly addressing systemic issues. Of course, none of those activities of APRA involve public enforcement action or the publicising of other action against a named RSE licensee. We observe at this stage, Commissioner, and before you have heard the evidence, two things. First, it is not obvious that it is possible to separate public enforcement action from a regulator properly undertaking conduct regulation. Secondly, there may be an inherent tension between, on the one hand, maintaining stability 
and on the other hand, the destabilising effect for one or more entities of public enforcement action. We will explore these issues when one or more witnesses from APRA are called at the conclusion of this round of hearings. Turning then to ASIC. ASIC has jurisdiction under both the CIS Act and the Corporations Act in relation to the superannuation industry. However, that jurisdiction is, in certain respects, limited. ASIC, in a statement provided to the Commission, has described its jurisdiction under the CIS Act as primarily limited to disclosure and complaints handling. ASIC's relevant jurisdiction under the Corporations Act includes responsibility for licensing and regulating the financial sector entities that provide financial services to funds and members, overseeing the compliance of directors of corporate trustees with their statutory duties, and monitoring funds My Super dashboard disclosure. I will return to My Super products later in this opening. ASIC is not responsible for overseeing the compliance of directors with their separate obligations imposed by the CIS Act to act in the best interests of members. These separate obligations arose from amendments made in response to recommendations made by the Cooper Review. ASIC has said in its statement to the Commission that if it were to have a greater role as conduct regulator for RSE's li RSE licensees, then it would need to be provided with additional powers. APRA has said in its statement that it is concerned that to remove or reduce APRA's powers to regulate conduct and practices in the superannuation industry would weaken APRA's ability to perform its mandate and achieve the outcomes that it achieves through its regulation and supervision of the industry. We will explore ASIC's approach to enforcement for matters related to superannuation when witnesses for ASIC are called at the conclusion of this round of hearings. The Productivity Commission has also noted in its recent draft report an issue in relation to regulatory overlap between APRA and ASIC in respect of the superannuation industry. ASIC and APRA have a memorandum of understanding that was last updated in 2010. Each of ASIC and APRA have told us in their statements to the Commission about a document in preparation. ASIC calls it a relationship statement. APRA calls it an information paper, which sets out their roles. As a perhaps unfortunate illustration of the confusion between the regulators, APRA, in a statement signed on Friday, says that ASIC and APRA are in the process of drafting the paper and once it is finalised, it will be published on the websites of both regulators. On the other hand, ASIC, in a finalised statement signed on Friday, exhibit what, exhibits what it terms the relationship statement and says that it is due to be released soon. The relationship statement may be a matter to which we return with at least one of the regulators when they appear at the conclusion of the hearings. On any view, there is not presently a dedicated conduct regulator for superannuation trustees in Australia. APRA is, and views itself as, a prudential regulator that adopts a different approach to other regulators. ASIC considers that its jurisdiction in relation to superannuation trustees is limited. So if consumers are unable to do anything more than peer dimly through the darkness at their superannuation trustees, and there is no dedicated and active conduct regulator shining a spotlight on the trustees and searching out bad behaviour, that leaves us with the third possible safeguard of Australians' retirement savings, reliance on compliance by the trustees themselves with their duties and legal obligations. The trustee has a statutory duty under the CIS Act to maintain the fund for the sole purpose of providing retirement benefits. The trustee has a fiduciary duty and a duty implied into the governing rules of the trust by the CIS Act to act in the best interests of members. The CIS Act also implies into the governing rules duties directly on the directors of a corporate trustee. But, of course, trustees are surrounded by temptation. To preference the interests of their sponsoring organisations, to act in the interests of other parts of their corporate group, to choose profit over the interests of members, to establish structures that consign to others the responsibility for the fund 
and thereby relieve the trustee of visibility of anything that might be troubling. Their duties oblige them to resist all of these temptations. And so we have the underlying question of this module, which arises from the terms of reference. What happens when we leave these trustees alone in the dark with our money? Can they be trusted to do the right thing? If they can, does that mean that the current regulatory system is adequate? If they can't, what must be done to protect Australians' retirement savings? And to what extent do the entities that own or control the trustees, who are not obliged to act in members' best interests, act in ways that are ultimately detrimental to members, even if they do not technically cause the trustee to breach the trustee's duties? We will, in a moment, summarise the issues that we will look at during these two weeks of hearings to assist you to consider and answer those questions. But before we do that, we think it would be helpful if we note two differences between the structure of this round of hearings and earlier rounds. First, there are no consumer witnesses in this round of hearings. That reflects the nature of the matters that we are investigating. The conduct and decisions with which we are concerned are unobserved and unobservable for most Australians. The conduct of a trustee might affect Australians financial position in a significant way by reducing the returns earned on their superannuation and therefore the amount available in retirement. But that is a difficult, if not impossible outcome for most people to detect. At the end of your working life, you know how much you have. You do not know how much you might have had, but for certain decisions made by your trustee of which you were not aware or of which you were only notified in an obscure way, if at all. Some members of the public have identified things that are amiss with their superannuation and raised this in public submissions. As at Friday, the Commission has received 7,961 submissions via its web portal. 1,244 of these submissions were identified by the consumer as relating to superannuation comprising 15.6% of all submissions received. Some of the key themes raised by consumers in their submissions were as follows. Concerns have been raised in many public submissions about fees for financial advice, management or administration that have not been disclosed to the consumer or resulted in any service being provided. Two examples include a fund commencing charging ongoing management fees without adequate explanation after three years of these fees not being charged, and inappropriate fees charged by financial advisors, including a consumer who was charged advisor fees despite having taken out the superannuation policy directly with the superannuation company in the absence of a financial advisor. Submitters also raised concerns about the provision or supposed provision of insurance by superannuation funds which had not been sought by the member. Submitters complained about the complexity of superannuation, particularly in respect of insurance policies that are included as a default in superannuation products. As an employer will generally determine an employee's default superannuation product, this process can be confusing for young people entering the workforce for the first time or people from non-English speaking backgrounds. These consumers are unaware of which insurances they have been signed up for within their superannuation and whether they are able to opt out. The second difference between this round of hearings and earlier rounds is that we will deliver an oral closing at the conclusion of these two weeks, but that closing will not address in detail the specific findings that we submit are or may be open to you in relation to specific entities. Rather, the oral closing will provide for you a summary of the types of policy issues in respect of which submissions are sought and the possible general findings that we will submit are open to you and give rise to these, po these policy issues. We hope that will assist both parties given leave to appear and other people interested in the policy issues to begin formulating their submissions to you on those issues. By the end of the following week, that is by 24 August 2018, Council Assisting will provide you with written submissions 
that address specific findings we submit are or may be open to you with respect to the entities, the subject of case studies, together with a written articulation of the policy issues. The provision of those written <coughs> submissions will mark the formal close of round five. Commissioner, having explained those differences, we now want to outline some things about our approach to investigations for this round of hearings. The Commission has published three background papers for this module. Background paper number 22 on superannuation prepared by the Royal Commission. Background paper 23, an overview of key regulatory reforms in superannuation prepared by Treasury. And background paper 25 on the legal framework governing aspects of the Australian superannuation system prepared by Professor Pamela Hanrahan. We have received submissions from some interested groups including the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees, the Financial Services Council, the Financial Services Institute of Australasia, and the Responsible Investment Association of Australia. We have also received submissions from bodies which assist consumers in relation to their dealings with superannuation entities, including the Consumer Action Law Centre and Choice. We sought responses from ASIC and APRA to various inquiries we had in relation to superannuation and their regulatory issues or concerns, and we met with representatives from each regulator, and they provided very helpful assistance in identifying some matters of concern. We've had one background meeting with the Productivity Commission during the course of the preparation of this round of hearings. As you know, Commissioner, the Productivity Commission published in May its draft report on stage three of its assessment of the Australian superannuation system. Your task necessarily involves a significant difference in approach to that of the Productivity Commission. The Productivity Commission begins with and is concerned by system-wide outcomes. Your task in this round begins with the question under your letters patent, with the question of whether a trustee or somebody with any connection to a trustee has engaged in misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations or has used retirement savings for a purpose that does not meet community standards and expectations or is not in the best interests of members. Your task necessarily begins with a focus on particular entities. You must then consider the contributing causes to such conduct and what recommendations you might make to address such conduct and the causes. We are focused on the flow of money into and through the trustees, the use of the money by the trustees and the governance of trustees dealing with the money. The draft recommendations of the Productivity Commission are of interest to us insofar as they might address any problems that are identified during the course of this round and we will discuss them in closing. However, we must begin, in accordance with your terms of reference, with the conduct of specific trustees or those connected with them, and then extrapolate to the general. Having said that, the funds that we have chosen represent a very significant proportion of funds under management within the Australian superannuation system. We are concerned under the terms of reference with the trustees of APRA regulated funds. As at 31 March 2018, there were 132 such trustees licensed by APRA and they held approximately 65% of total superannuation assets. These RSE licensees are trustees of two types of funds, large APRA funds, which have more than four members, and small APRA funds, which have four members or less. As at March 2018, the 132 RSE licensees were the trustees of 205 large APRA funds and 2,085 small APRA funds. We have focused upon large APRA funds in this module. These large APRA funds can then in turn be split into four categories. Corporate funds, of which there are 24 funds holding $54.7 billion in assets. These are not-for-profit funds and are arranged by an employer for its employees. Public sector funds, of which there are 18 funds holding $443.4 billion in assets. These are also not-for-profit 
and cater to government employees. Industry funds, of which there are 40 funds holding $598.8 billion in assets. These are not-for-profit and in a few cases may only, in a few but limited cases, may only be open to employees in particular industries. However, many, including all of the funds that we will consider in this module, are now open to the public. Finally, retail funds, of which there are 123 funds holding $602.6 .6 billion in assets. These are for-profit funds. These funds are usually run by banks and investment companies and generally have a large number of investment options. This round of hearings will focus on retail funds and industry funds. As at 31 March 2018, both industry and retail funds each held around 35% of the assets of APRA regulated funds. As at the end of the 2017 financial year, three of the five largest superannuation funds were Australian Super, with then $123 billion under management, MLC Super Fund, with then $77 billion under management, and Colonial First State First Choice Superannuation Trust, with then $72 billion under management. All of these funds have grown since 30 June 2017, and all will be the subject of consideration in this module. As at 30 June 2017, of the 168 superannuation funds whose reporting date was 30 June, and asset size has been published by APRA, only 34 funds, around 20%, held assets of over $10 billion. But these 34 funds held around 83% of the superannuation assets published. In selecting trustees for examination during this module, we took the information we gathered from various sources and came up with a long list of trustees for examination. You issued compulsory notices to approximately 50 trustees, some of whom operate a number of funds, seeking production of the last five years of board papers and other documents. We sent rubrics to approximately 40 trustees asking the trustees to voluntarily provide us with substantial amounts of background information. We received very substantial cooperation. From there, we progressively narrowed down to focus on, excluding Q Super, the final 13 trustees or groups of trustees in a couple of cases for this module. We should make two final observations about that process. First is an observation about the nature of the conduct <coughs> that we considered raised sufficient questions to warrant consideration during the oral round of hearings as to whether that conduct is misconduct or conduct falling below community standards. As we have already indicated, you have issued many notices for this round and those notices have produced many documents for the Commission to review. For both retail and industry trustees, you have required production of many types of board and committee packs and internal documents. For certain industry funds, you have required production of credit card statements for credit cards used by any member of the board, the chief executive officer, or any senior member of management of the trustee, production of documents from sponsoring unions and employers or employer organisations, and production of documents from various companies forming part of the group of companies owned by industry super holdings. On the whole, it is our view that the Commission's review of documents identified fewer examples of types of conduct of the industry fund trustees that raise questions warranting oral consideration as to whether the conduct is misconduct or conduct falling below community standards or inappropriate use of retirement savings when compared with that of the retail funds that will appear in this round of hearings. In a number of cases, though certainly not all, the conduct of the industry funds which we have identified as warranting consideration during the oral hearings is very nuanced. Secondly, we will not be considering conduct that is presently the subject of litigation before the court. Let us give two examples of such conduct. We will not be considering the allegations about the selling practices of BT Westpac that are presently the subject of a reserve decision in the federal court. We will also not be considering the allegations in an unfair dismissal case against Australian Super. Commissioner, we will now give an overview 
of the issues that we will explore during this round of hearings to assist you in answering the questions that we have identified. Since, publish since publishing the PRACI, Council Assisting have decided that we will tender the statements from United Super, better known as CBUS, but will not call witnesses from CBUS to give oral evidence. I will, however, summarise the evidence of CBUS with respect to two of the issues that we are interested in exploring as I come to them. For the 12 trustees or groups of trustees, that is excluding Q Super, the examination of their witnesses will consider one or more topics falling within the following three main groups. First, the ways in which trustees or their related entities seek to cause members to join or stay with their fund. Secondly, trustees monitoring of the use and performance of members' funds. Thirdly, the structural and government governance arrangements that exist for trustees. In many cases, an issue in one group will lead inevitably to an issue in another. For example, retail fund trustees permit the payment of grandfather commission to financial advisors. The payment of commission may cause those members to be kept in the fund, and that is a topic from the first group. That will then lead inevitably to a question from the third group about the structural arrangements of the trustee and whether they are sufficient to monitor advice being provided to members of the fund and paid for out of the superannuation assets by the trustee. Commissioner, within the first group, concerning the ways in which trustees or their related entities seek to gain or keep members, we particularly draw your attention to the following four topics. First, the selling practices of banks in relation to the superannuation products offered by their related party trustee. Stricter consumer protection laws apply to banks as holders of financial services licences when their representatives give personal advice about complex financial products such as superannuation. This includes the requirement to act in the customer's best interests. Personal advice is advice given to a person in circumstances where the provider of the advice has considered one or more of the person's objectives, financial situation and needs. In July of this year, ASIC accepted court enforceable undertakings from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and the Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, pursuant to which those entities have agreed to change the way they distribute superannuation products to their customers through their bank branches. ASIC observed a common practice of offering those products to customers at the conclusion of a fact-finding process about customers' overall banking arrangements. ASIC was concerned that the proximity between the fact-finding process and the discussion about the product was leading branch staff to provide personal advice to customers about their superannuation when they were only authorised to provide general advice. And also, the customers may have thought, due to the proximity of the fact-finding process to the offer of the product, that the branch staff were considering risks specific to the customer when this was not in fact the case. These court enforceable undertakings prevent CBA and ANZ from distributing the relevant superannuation products in conjunction with the fact-finding process. CBA and ANZ were also required to each make a $1.25 million community benefit payment. There was no remediation. We will explore this conduct and the giving of the enforceable undertakings with CBA, ANZ and ASIC. Second, the making of payments by industry funds to their sponsoring organisations or affiliates of the trustee to assist or purportedly to assist with the marketing of their funds. By sponsoring organisations, we mean the organisations that own the shares in the trustee or are associated with those owners. This was an issue in respect of which we sought evidence from CBUS. CBUS's shareholder organisations are Master Builders Australia, the Construction, Forestry, Mining and en Energy Union, the Communications, Electrical, Electronic, Energy, Information, Postal, Plumbing and Allied Services Union, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union and the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Like many industry funds, CBUS has partnership agreements with many of its shareholder organisations, including both trade unions and employer organisations. In 2015, a review by KPMG 
identified that United Super had paid over $7 million to its shareholder organisations over five years, but there were no formal processes or requirements to track whether the agreed benefits had been delivered. Following delivery of that report, United Super introduced a number of process changes and engaged an independent consultant to review the benefits of the agreements. The result was a revised industry partnership strategy and evaluation model, which measure, measured a range of variables and made an assessment of the overall value of each partnership, whether with a shareholder or other industry organisation, to United Super. The model was first implemented in the 2017 financial year. Our review suggests that although some of the assessment is necessarily subjective, and it is not clear whether the model is rigorously applied in all instances, the model provides a considered framework by which United Super can assess whether its arrangements with shareholder organisations are in the best interests of CBUS members. However, although we will not explore this issue with CBUS, we will explore the issue of payments to sponsoring organisations or affiliates with other industry funds that will appear during this round of hearings. It is particularly important that such payments be carefully monitored because of the obvious potentials for conflicts of interest. The third topic within this group is the continued payment of grandfathered commissions by retail funds. None of the industry funds that we have reviewed were paying commission. However, save for MRSA, the major retail funds in respect of which you will hear oral evidence are all, five years after FOFA came into effect, paying very substantial amounts of commission. You may very well wonder, Commissioner, how the payment of commission to financial advisors could be in the best interests of members of superannuation funds. You may also wonder how the payment of commission satisfies the sole purpose test. The fourth topic in this group we will consider is the approach of trustees to members who have multiple superannuation accounts, either within the same fund or in a different fund. As at 30 June 2017, over 14.8 million Australians had a superannuation account. Despite attempts in recent years to encourage Australians to combine their superannuation <coughs> accounts, the percentage of employees holding only one superannuation account increased only slightly between 2013 and 2016 from 55% to 60%. That is to say, 40% of Australians continued to hold more than one account. The multiplicity of accounts gives rise to significant concerns about duplicative administrative costs and also the significant cost of multiple insurance policies that in some cases will not all be able to be answered. There is no doubt that insurance and superannuation can be of value to individuals. However, the insurance premiums deducted by the fund trustees from member accounts are also a key driver of balance erosion and can reduce low income earners' retirement balances particularly when coupled with the high prevalence of multiple accounts. Of people with insurance and superannuation, over 20% or around 2.5 million people have two or more accounts with insurance cover. One way in which the government has sought to address the problem is by, legislate, is by legislation dealing with lost accounts. Circumstances in which a member is a lost member include where the member is uncontactable or the member is inactive. A member is uncontactable if various conditions are satisfied, including that either the fund never had an address for the member or the trustee has attempted to contact the member in writing at the last known address and the trustee believes, on reasonable grounds, that the member can no longer be contacted at any address known to the fund. A member is an inactive member in circumstances in which they have been a member of the fund for longer than two years, and they joined the fund as a standard employer-sponsored member, and the fund has not received a contribution or rollover for the member within the last five years of their membership of the fund. However, even if inactive, a member will not be deemed lost if within the preceding two years, the fund has verified that the member's address is correct and has no reason to believe that the address is now incorrect, or the member is permanently excluded <coughs> from being a lost member because they have indicated by a positive act that they wish to continue being a member of the fund, or they have contacted the super provider at any time after they joined the fund 
and indicated that they wished to continue being a member of the fund. <coughs> we will return to that carve out in a moment. The government has recently proposed further legislative changes to attempt to address these issues. In the 2018-19 budget, the government announced that it would legislate to ensure the cover is offered on an opt-in basis for accounts of members below the age of 25, inactive accounts that have not received a contribution in 13 months, where the member has not elected to retain existing cover, and low balance accounts below $6,000. It was estimated that around 5 million individuals will have the opportunity to save an estimated $3 billion in insurance premiums by choosing to opt in to this cover rather than paying for it by default. The reforms also include a ban on exit fees for all accounts designed to benefit the many Australians who want to roll over their superannuation accounts to a different fund or access their superannuation. Exit fees cost members $52 million in 2016-17. The reforms will also make changes with respect to inactive low balance accounts. Accounts which do not have insurance cover have balances below $6,000 and which have not received a contribution or rollover for 13 months will be transferred to the ATO to protect them from further erosion. For the first time, the ATO will be empowered to proactively reunite these accounts alongside lost superannuation it already holds with a member's active accounts where that is possible, thereby boosting their balances at retirement. Together, the government expects that these changes will send $6 billion of superannuation back to 3 million Australians in 2019-20. We, however, are concerned with how trustees are dealing with the current regulatory regime. We will examine whether trustees are acting in the best interests of members in circumstances in which they know that they have members that have multiple accounts within the same fund. We will also examine the conduct of trustees who take steps that stop a member's account being classified as lost and thereby avoid the obligation to transfer the account to the Commissioner of Taxation. Commissioner, the second group of topics is concerned with monitoring of the use and performance of member funds. We draw your attention to six topics from this group. First, the payment for financial advice or other services from the assets of the fund. Consumers can receive advice regarding their superannuation from a financial advisor independent of their fund or through the fund, so long as the advice concerns the preservation of their retirement benefits. ASFA notes that it is relatively common for the bulk of costs of scaled advice to be covered by general administration fees charged to members by funds or a combination of a general administrative fee and a specific fee for the service provided. By contrast, the costs of providing full personal advice are recovered by a specific fee linked to the account of the member receiving the advice. Retail funds expend relatively more on financial advice paid for by members than other types of superannuation funds. The payment for such advice has given rise to a substantial number of fees for no service issues. Some of those were addressed in round two. We return to them here from a different perspective. In round two, we considered these issues from the, from the perspective of the providers of financial advice. In this round, we consider fees from no service from the perspective of the so-called product manufacturer. That is, in this case, the superannuation trustee. In this respect, a number of trustees, the subject of this round of hearings, have admitted misconduct or possible misconduct concerning fees for no service in submissions or witness statements provided to the Commission. AMP, CBA and IOOF have acknowledged fees for no service conduct that we believe must have affected the trustee or trustees of a superannuation fund within their respective retail groups, though they may not have necessarily made that specific link in their submissions. Nullis nominees owned by the NAB group acknowledged in NAB submissions that it has engaged in the conduct that it characterised as misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to superannuation. Statements from Nullis witnesses have also been provided to the Commission. In its submissions, 
NAB acknowledged that between September 2012 and January 2017, approximately $35 million in planned service fees were incorrectly charged to 220,460 members and deducted from their accounts where they either did not have a plan advisor linked to their account. I'm sorry, where they did not have a plan advisor linked to their account. NAB also acknowledged that the correspondence issued to these members also potentially misled members by not disclosing that PSFs would be charged or that members could opt out of PSFs. As at June 2017, approximately $35 million had been repaid to 220,460 affected customers. In a statement provided to the Commission, Nullis also acknowledged that it had announced on 26 July 2018 that it would stop deducting a planned service fee from the MLC Master Key Personal Super accounts from 30 September 2018. It acknowledged that it did not clearly communicate to those members that they could opt out of this fee if they no longer wanted to access the general advice. As a result of this conduct, approximately 205,000 current Master Key Personal Super members will be refunded the planned service pay fees they paid whilst in this product. Nullis, in a statement to the Commission last week, estimated that approximately $87.1 million in refunds and other compensation to these members will be paid. ANZ owns One Path and Oasis Fund Management. ANZ acknowledged in its submissions that from 2003 to 2015, certain One Path entities continued to deduct advisor service fees from the accounts of about 2,900 members of managed investment scheme and superannuation funds after these accounts ceased to be allocated to an advisor. The total fees incorrectly deducted were $931,647.56. The incorrect deductions were not remitted to any advisor. These breaches were reported to ASIC and APRA. ANZ has reimbursed customers for the incorrectly charged fees together with interest. No reimbursement or compensation was made to 255 affected customers who suffered financial effects of $20 or less and who had exited the relevant managed investment scheme or fund. Amounts not paid to customers in these circumstances were paid into the relevant fund. In addition, two entities that are not the subject of oral case studies <coughs> acknowledged fees for no service conduct. The Westpac Group owns BT Funds Management. BT offered Asgard products. Westpac acknowledged that some cu customers of the Asgard products continued to be charged advice-related fees which were retained by the trustee when they ceased to be advised by financial advisors and the trustees should have ceased charging those fees. Westpac identified that 767 accounts were affected. As a result of the identification of the issue, customers were remediated $634,490 in aggregate comprising reimbursement of the fees incorrectly charged and compensatory interest. The other entity is State Plus. In 2016, the trustee of First State Superannuation Scheme acquired State Super Financial Services Australian Limited, the trustee of State Plus Superannuation. A review of the State Plus business practices and service provision to members was initiated soon thereafter. That review detected that a group of members of State Plus had paid for advice as part of their management fees, but those members had not been provided the relevant advice. ASIC was notified in May 2017. Since then, State Plus has engaged with ASIC and formulated a remediation plan for the 46,534 members affected. It is anticipated that member remediation is to be concluded this month, and a total amount of $92 million is said in a statement filed with the Commission to be more than sufficient to cover all project expenses and fee repayments. The sec second topic in this group is the ways in which funds monitor the performance of the products that they are offering and how they engage in performance attribution. Performance attribution is the explanation for why the performance of a product differs from the benchmark for performance. We will consider this specifically in relation to my super products. We will also examine Australian Super's monitoring and management of its indirect investment in Pacific Hydro 
through a fund managed by industry funds management. Third, <coughs> related to the preceding topic, we will consider the way in which trustees go about carrying out their statutory obligation to perform an annual MySuper scale test. There are a few concepts, Commissioner, that I ought to explain in relation to that, beginning with MySuper. The introduction of MySuper products was a recommendation of the Cooper Review. MySuper products are designed to have a simple set of product features suitable for members who do not necessarily actively engage with their superannuation. Legislation restricts the types of fees that can be charged on MySuper products and limits the investment options that are available to either a single diversified option or a life cycle option. All MySuper products must also contain life and permanent disability insurance on an opt-out basis, with some exceptions. No commissions can be paid on my super products. APRA must authorise the trustee of a superannuation fund to offer a my super product, and most funds can only offer one my super product. My super products are default products. If a person cannot or does not choose their superannuation fund, an employer is required to make the superannuation contributions for the employee into a default superannuation fund selected by the employer. Since 1 January 2014, an employer must select a fund that offers a MySuper product, and default contributions must be paid into the MySuper product unless an investment choice has been made. As at 31 March 2018, there were 92 superannuation entities that offered 107 MySuper products. Six entities offered more than one MySuper product. As at 30 June 2017, 56% of accounts were MySuper accounts. Almost all of that 56% arose from default fund arrangements rather than being chosen by members. However, when looking at the amount of money each account holds, the majority of superannuation money, around two thirds, is placed in choice products rather than MySuper products. As at 30 June 2017, industry funds had the highest proportion of MySuper member accounts, comprising approximately 86% of all industry fund accounts, and MySuper member benefits approximately 65% of all industry fund member benefits or assets, as well as the highest number of members who had chosen to remain in a MySuper product. Under section 29VN of the CIS Act, a trustee of a fund that includes a MySuper product must determine on an annual basis whether the members holding the MySuper product are disadvantaged when compared with the beneficiaries of other funds because of the scale of the MySuper product that they hold. We will consider how the funds go about making that annual determination. We should also note that in December 2017, APRA released a new prudential standard for consultation which proposed changes to the assessment of outcomes for members of registrable superannuation entities. The new prudential standard would apply to all RSE licensees and require annual assessment of the outcomes provided to members using a broader range of measures. If, when undertaking the outcomes assessment, an RSE licensee determines that changes to its operations would likely improve outcomes for beneficiaries, the RSE licensee must assess the costs and benefits of implementing those changes, and where that cost-benefit analysis supports doing so, the RSE licensee must reflect those changes in its annual review of its business plan. But that outcomes assessment is not one that is presently in effect. The fourth topic in this group is the transfer of accrued default amounts to a MySuper product. As we have said, from 1 January 2014, a trustee was obliged to attribute all default contributions to a MySuper product unless an investment election had been made. However, a member of a fund may have already had superannuation co contributions in a default product before 1 January 2014. Those existing amounts are called accrued default amounts or ADAs. ADAs might, if they are in a retail fund, be subject to higher fees than contributions in the MySuper product. ADAs might, if they are in a retail fund, be subject to trailing commissions, whereas no commission can be paid on MySuper products. 
The transitional provisions required trustees to transfer all ADAs to my super products by 30 June 2017. But, of course, trustees could transfer ADAs to my super products at an earlier date. You will need to consider, Commissioner, whether you would expect that trustees acting in their members' best interests would transfer members' ADAs to my super as early as possible. There was, we note, a marked difference between when industry funds, as a general rule, transferred their ADAs to a my super products and when the retail funds did so. The question for you will be whether the delay in those transfers was in the members' best interests. The fifth topic in this group is the consideration of cash returns by certain retail funds. As is well known, some retail funds in Australia are providing very low returns on cash. We will examine what the reasons for this might be. The sixth topic in this group is spending on marketing and advertising by industry funds. We will look at two particular examples, the New Daily and Fox and Hen House. The New Daily is an online publication that was originally funded by a group of industry funds and was then transferred to industry super holdings. It might be useful at this point, Commissioner, for us to just say something very briefly about the structure of industry super holdings. Industry super holdings is a company owned by a number of industry funds. Australian super is the largest, holder, largest shareholder in industry super holdings, followed by CBUS, Hester and Host Plus. Industry Super Holdings owns various entities that provide services to the industry funds. For example, Industry Fund Services Proprietary Limited is a subsidiary of ISH, which provides financial advice to industry fund members. Industry Super Australia is also wholly, a wholly owned subsidiary of Industry Super Holdings. ISA provides research, policy development, government relations, advocacy and promotional services for industry super funds. A number of industry funds pay quarterly contributions to fund the services provided by ISA. One particular campaign of ISA that attracted significant attention last year was an advertisement referred to as Fox and Hen House. The question that has arisen with respect to this ad is how it satisfies the sole purpose test. How does it maintain retirement benefits? APRA considered this last year and sought responses from two participating funds that they were satisfied that the decision to support the expense of the campaign was in the best interests of members and satisfied the sole purpose test. We will explore this issue with some industry funds. Commissioner, the third and final group of topics is concerned with structural and governance arrangements. We will mention five topics within this group. First, the structural arrangements for the monitoring of advice provided by financial advisors but paid for out of the assets of the super fund and, therefore, subject to the sole purpose test and the trustees' best interest duties. One example of an issue in relation to the monitoring of advice given by financial advisors is advice to members to make an investment choice. The consequence of a member making an investment choice is that her or his guarantee contributions will no longer be paid into the My Super product. Instead, the trustee allocates the contributions to a choice product. The choice product might still attract commission under grandfathered arrangements. A financial advisor might therefore have an incentive to advise a member to switch to a choice product to reinstate commissions. A retail group might also have an incentive to bring about switching if the advisors are affiliated with the group. Conduct that gives rise to this type of issue was the subject of a breach notice by Aon Hewitt Limited in March of this year. It related to the conduct of two authorised representatives of Aon Hewitt Limited's wholly owned financial services entity, Aon Hewitt Financial Advice. First, during 2016 and 2017, one authorised representative had written to the clients who were members of the Aon Master Trust, advising clients that their superannuation balance and future contributions would be invested in their existing AMT investment options. If those clients wanted to deposit funds in the My Super option, 
they had to contact the advisor within 30 days of the letter. The letter constituted personal advice. The authorised representative had provided no statement of advice and had received no written directions from clients to opt out of my super. Second, Aon reported that another authorised representative had switched clients to choice products in the Aon Master Trust in circumstances where there were no records that the client had given informed consent to do so. We will, Commissioner, in due course, tender the statements in relation to Aon. The second topic is an entity within a retail group receiving payments from third party managed investment schemes where those payments are calculated by reference to the investments of the super fund. This, Commissioner, we accept is a little complicated. We'll give just one example of this. A trustee of a retail fund might invest the member's funds in a managed investment scheme operated by another entity within the retail group. That other entity, for convenience, we'll refer to it here as the group investor, then invests the money in various third-party managed investment schemes. Those third-party managed investment schemes will probably be major investment funds of the types that most of us have heard of. There may also be another agreement between the third party managed investment fund and either the group investor or a different entity within the group. That side agreement will provide that the third party managed investment scheme will pay for investments made in it by the group investor. If the agreement was pre-FOFA, then the agreement will likely provide that the payments are to be a percentage of the funds invested. If the agreement is post-FOFA, then it will be will likely be some dollar value. And you may recall, Commissioner, that we looked at this issue of MIS rebates to some extent during the second round of hearings in relation to platforms. It may be that a substantial proportion of the funds invested by the group investor will have been derived from the superannuation assets. The question then is how, if at all, the benefits of these payments are passed back to members of the superannuation fund, given that the payments are derived from investments of the members' money. It may be, in some cases, that the way in which that benefit is passed back is by reduced fees that are ultimately charged to the members. We will consider some examples of whether the trustees dealing with these types of payments have acted in the best interests of members. The third topic is the use of a particular structural arrangement by retail funds whereby the trustee is a dual regulated entity, or DRE. This is, as we understand it, a structure of some concern to APRA. It was the structure of TRIO Capital. The structure works like this. One company is both the trustee of the superannuation fund and also the responsible entity for one or more managed investment schemes. All or most of the assets of the superannuation fund are invested by the trustee with itself in the managed investment scheme or schemes that it operates. We will consider whether the use of such a structure raises issues as to the proper management of the trustee's duty to act in the best interests of members and what dangers this type of structure might present for members. The fourth topic we will consider is another potential problem with structural arrangements within retail funds the outsourcing of functions to other parts of the retail group in a way that prevents the trustee from having any realistic prospect of being able to identify and monitor breaches and be satisfied that it is acting in the best interests of members. The fifth topic is the appointment of directors to the boards of corporate trustees of industry funds. There are a number of requirements in relation to the composition and structure of trustee boards. First, the composition of the boards of RSE licensees <coughs> may be prescribed to ensure an equal representation of members and employers. Legislation introduced by the government in 2017 would, if passed, require that all RSE licensees have an independent chair and at least one third independent directors. Second, directors, along with the company secretary and senior managers, are responsible persons of the RSE licensee and must be fit and proper according to APRA's prudential standard SPS 520. The standard includes requirements that an RSE licensee must have and implement 
a fit and proper policy that meets the requirements of this prudential standard. The fitness and propriety of a responsible person must generally be assessed prior to initial appointment and then reassessed annually. And that an RSC licensee must take all prudent steps to ensure that a person is not appointed to or does not continue to hold a responsible person position for which, for which they are not fit and proper. More generally, RSE licensees are required to comply with APRA Prudential Standard SPS 510 dealing with governance. Its key requirements are that the board must have a governance framework, which includes at a minimum the board's charter or equivalent document and policies and processes that achieve appropriate skills, structure and composition of the board, and that the board must have a written policy which sets out requirements relating to the nomination, appointment and removal of directors that support appropriate board composition and renewal on an ongoing basis. Many industry funds are resistant to the introduction of a legislative requirement that there be a minimum number of minimum number or percentage of independent directors of the trustee. That is likely only one aspect of the issue. Another issue is having a board of directors selected based on the appropriate skills and needs of the board. The Cooper Review made recommendations to improve governance practices, which included that trustee boards be modernised to include a critical mass of independent directors in line with international best practice. In particular, the Cooper Review recommended that, at the very least, equal employer and member representation trustee boards should have a minimum one-third non-associated directors, although a requirement for a majority of independent directors was preferred. The Financial System Inquiry, known as the Murray Inquiry, also recommended measures that sought to strengthen governance of the superannuation system. The Murray Inquiry went further than the Cooper Review and proposed to mandate a majority of independent directors on the board of corporate trustees of public office superannuation funds, including an independent chair. It noted that including independent directors on boards is consistent with international best practice, aids decision making and holds other directors accountable, specifically in relation to conflicts of interest. We will consider two aspects of this issue. One aspect is the exercise by a sponsoring organisation of its constitutional rights to replace directors in a manner that may raise, question, may raise a question as to whether the change of directors was in the best interests of members or detrimental to sound corporate governance. Another aspect that we will consider is whether a sponsoring organisation wishing to retain an unfettered right to appoint directors might be a barrier to a merger. Appointment of directors was the other matter in respect of which we obtained specific evidence from CBUS. CBUS's board has an equal representation structure. Its shareholding bodies are entitled to appoint one director for each share held. Seven directors are appointed by Master Builders Australia and seven directors appointed by the union shareholders. The board also has one independent director appointed after a search for appropriate nominees and the chair who is nominated by the ACTU following consultation between, the United, between CBUS's various stakeholders. As a result, CBUS's board ordinarily has 16 directors. At least since 2013, some within CBUS have raised concerns that the size of the board impedes its ability to carry out its, func its functions effectively, although others within CBUS do not share or did not share that view. In 2015, CBUS engaged an independent consultant to review the effectiveness of its board. This review included interviews with all board members and executive management and an assessment of whether CBUS's arrangements were consistent with better practices for a superannuation fund of CBUS's size and complexity. The review recommended that the trustee company United Super reduce its board size to 12 members as a high priority with a target achievement date of the end of 2016. The next year, APRA conducted a prudential review of United Super. It noted that typically the boards made consensus decisions, but that a strain to reach consensus could impede effective decision making. It expressed concerns that the size of the board was one factor that was likely to be inhibiting to this process. In contrast, 
United Super does not consider that the size of the board affects its effectiveness or efficiency. Nevertheless, since the 2015 report, both the Chair and CEO have raised the size of the board with United Super's shareholders. In August 2017, the Master Builders Association proposed that both they and the CFMEU relinquish a board seat. As part of the proposal, an employer-nominated director appointed following an in internal recommendation from United Super would be moved to the independent director position. However, the shareholders could not reach an agreement. Because no change is possible without shareholder consent, the board's size and composition remained unal remains unaltered. For this reason, rather than any considered decision of United Super, the changes recommended since 2015 have not been made. As with other industry funds, the selection of a shareholder of shareholder nominated directors is largely a matter for the particular shareholder of United Super. When seeking nominations from a shareholder, United Super sets out any skill or experience gaps or diversity targets identified by the board. In recent years, shareholders have nominated certain directors on the basis of their skills or experience, despite the candidate having no existing ties to shareholders or United Super. However, although United Super must ensure that each director satisfies legislative and regulatory requirements, it cannot require that a shareholder nominate a director having any particular experience or skills. And so some directors continue to be appointed on the basis of their affiliation with shareholder organisations, not necessarily solely on the basis of their ability to contribute to the board. We will explore issues in relation to independent directors and qualifications of directors with other industry funds during oral evidence. As is apparent from the Precy published by the Commission two weeks ago, Q Super will also be examined during this round of hearings. It will be examined in relation to a separate issue of the way in which RSE licensees deal with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members of the funds of which they are trustees. Commissioner, that concludes the oral opening. If we would it be convenient to take, take a, a break, minute break? Uh, we come back at 11, Mr Hyde. Could we come back at 10 past 11, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> it's the first day, Mr Hodge, 10 past. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs>